Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about salmonella and salmonella-related food poisoning. Of all the cases of foodborne illness, may be responsible for 25 to 40 percent among the top three causes in the United States. This year, there will be in excess of 1,200,000 people affected by the organism. We're going to have 23,000 hospitalizations or more, and 450 people going to die because of the organism, because of the food poisoning. We have uh, bacteria that's widespread in nature, not only in humans, but also in livestock and wildlife and domestic pets, and even in pond water sediment lives in the intestine. And then we're infected when we eat contaminated food or drink contaminated water. The Centers for Disease Control says an outbreak exists when at least two people have the same illness from the same contaminated food or drink. There have been hundreds of reported outbreaks, but the overwhelming majority of people are not part of those outbreaks. They're just individual cases that are reported or not even reported. And oftentimes people don't even know that they're infected. We had an epidemic recently where jalapeno peppers and serrano peppers were contaminated. That led to an outbreak in 43 different states that involved more than 1,400 people. In 2018, we again were reminded that we have a current ongoing epidemic. We have a major problem with contamination in the turkey industry, in the chicken industry. These are not just individual plants. These are multiple plants and multiple processing facilities. The involvement has been in more than 30 different states. The organism oftentimes has been found to be resistant to multiple different antibiotics. And in 2018, we also had recall of more than 200 million eggs because of potential for contamination. Kellogg's Honey Smacks was recalled. The Centers for Disease Control said, don't eat raw cookie dough because it has eggs in it and the eggs can be contaminated with salmonella. And most recently, in early December of 2018, the government continued an ongoing recall of raw beef products, now up to 70, I'm sorry, 12 million pounds because of an outbreak in 25 different states. The organism itself is a bacteria. It's called a gram-negative organism. It's a very small rod, sort of looks like the tip of a lead pencil, and it's surrounded by little hair cells or flagella that allow it to attach. We know that the organism was given its name in 1900 in honor of Dr. Salmon. Dr. Salmon was a veterinarian at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Everyone is susceptible, but there are certain people who are extra susceptible, and those people who are extra susceptible are infants who aren't breastfed and children before the age of five, and the elderly, and people who have bowel disease, people who have ear inflammatory bowel disease, colitis, Crohn's disease, regional enteritis, people who have recently taken antibiotics, people who are taking antacids, because acid is an important mechanism we have to kill the bacteria. People who are immunosuppressed are receiving immunosuppressants, all of those fancy psoriasis drugs and the fancy arthritis drugs, they all suppress your resistance. Multiple sclerosis drugs or prednisone, other causes of increased susceptibility. Diabetics, people who have HIV, people who have pernicious anemia, it doesn't take all that many organisms to become infected. It actually takes about 100,000 because they have to get through the stomach acid. But in other cases, for instance, E. coli that you've heard so much about, takes 100 million organisms to become infected with that. Most of the time, if you are infected, you're not going to have any symptoms. Somewhere between 94 and 99 plus percent of people infection doesn't cause any illness. If it does cause an illness, it typically is caused will cause a mild illness. There are about 40 times more people who are infected than who have any illness. 
Some people will become severely ill. Most people just have plain uh, and pleasant situation that exists for a little while. The spread of the organism is from food or the environment or from pets or improper washing of your hands. Sometimes it can be spread from person to person. You have to have good bugs in your gut, your normal microbiota, the normal flora in your intestinal system is probably, along with the acid, the biggest guard that you have against developing this kind of an organism, this kind of an infection. It's said when you're infected that you have gastroenteritis or the stomach flu, but it's not the flu and it doesn't involve your stomach. Actually, it involves the lower part of your small intestine or your colon. It can occur year round with maybe a small increase in June, July, and August in the summertime. The incubation period is between eight and 72 hours. The condition itself the disease lasts from two days to a week. It's worse during the first two days. But it can take your bowel movements in excess of several months to get back to normal. And when you're back to normal, you might be left with the irritable bowel syndrome. The condition begins suddenly. You have crampy abdominal pain. You can't tell what you're infected with. You think you have food poisoning, but it's the same basic symptoms that you get with a virus like norovirus or other bacteria like E. coli or sometimes a parasitic infection. You have a fever here that typically is 100 to 102. You have diarrhea. Sometimes it's bloody. Sometimes it has mucus or pus in it. Sometimes associated with nausea and vomiting and headache or body aches. Associated with chills, you can become dehydrated. And the dehydration can be so severe that it can affect your kidney function. Sometimes the organism is invasive. It gets into the system. It gets into your bloodstream. It causes a bacteremia that can lead to sepsis of severe nature. Those are the people who unfortunately can go on and die. You can develop meningitis, endocarditis, infecting the heart, osteomyelitis, affecting the bone. And sometimes it can leave its residual. It can leave a reactive arthritis involving swollen joints, painful joints, arthritis of your knees and your ankles and your heels and your feet. It sometimes is associated with eye irritation, painful urination. We call it Reiter's syndrome. It comes on about a month after the acute infection and often lasts in excess of six months. Now, some people seem to be genetically predisposed to develop that. Well, most of the time, the salmonella can stay in your intestine for up to a month and children even longer. But some people will become carriers. It's probably not a good idea, by the way, if you have the infection and you have a slight temperature elevation to take aspirin because, remember, you might have bloody diarrhea. You don't want to bleed even further. And you want to be careful the kind of foods that you're eating. You don't want to have a lot of high fat or spicy foods because it's going to further irritate your gut. Most of the time, we don't culture the organism, but it's readily apparent. Most people who are infected seem to get better without taking any antibiotics. It's just a short course of illness. You're a little bit sick, more uncomfortable than not, but the organism goes away. Except sometimes you need antibiotics, especially in infants or the elderly individuals or people who are on immunosuppressive therapy. But remember, the antibiotics, they can alter the normal bacteria in the gut, the normal flora, and the normal flora are extraordinarily important. They compete for space with the bad bugs and they take up the nutrients and they decrease the amount of iron that the salmonella need to grow. If you need an antibiotic, chances are it's going to be a simple antibiotic like Bactrim or ampicillin, amoxicillin, azithromycin. But now we have a problem with increasing resistance of the salmonella to different kinds of antibiotics. As a matter of fact, about 5% of salmonella are resistant to more than five different kinds of antibiotics. Now, the cause of food poisoning isn't always obvious. And remember, the symptoms can overlap between E. coli, traveler's diarrhea, Campylobacter, Listeria, Staph, Clostridia, viruses, parasites like amoeba or Giardia, or maybe even inflammatory bowel disease, not even an infection. 
when we started typing the salmonella, there were 44 different types in 1934. Now we're almost 2,600 types. Now remember, this is food poisoning, and it doesn't have to come from meat and eggs. It can come from honey smack cereal or Ritz crackers. It can come from extra cheddar goldfish. It can come from the imported peppers or frozen pot pies or peanut butter or hungry man boneless chicken wings dinner or from raw milk, or even from pre-cut melons and coconut and sauces and toppings and chocolate and contaminated whey. Lots of different ways to get the salmonella inside your body. If you look at a food, could you tell that it's contaminated? No. Nope. Looks normal, smells normal. But remember, almost any food can be contaminated, and it can be contaminated either before it gets into your house or even become contaminated inside your house. We have contamination in alfalfa sprouts and seeds and beans. You have to be especially careful to wash your hands, especially if you've touched your pet, if you changed the diaper of a child. You have to wash your hands. You have a cutting board. You have to be extraordinarily careful. Don't use the cutting board that you've cut some meat product or some poultry product on to cut the fruit or the vegetables. Be careful with contaminated meltwater when you defrost a chicken. And by the way, you shouldn't wash a chicken before you cook it. It can spread the bacteria. And food handlers, you have to make sure that you wash your hands before you go back to the kitchen. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about commercial food handlers, or whether we're talking about people in their own homes. And remember, we talk about the poultry as a major source, the chicken and the turkey, but we're also talking about the meat and the fish and the eggs and the unpasteurized milk. Cross-contamination frequently occurs in the kitchen. We talk about eggs. Eggs can be infected. You remember where eggs come from, what part of uh, chicken they come from. Well, just think additionally that those eggs can be contaminated inside the shell, not just on the outside of the shell, so you have to wash the egg, but they can be contaminated on the inside, inside from directly from the hen, from the hen's ovary. If the chicken was infected, and you also have to remember that hundreds of thousands of people every year are going to unknowingly eat eggshell portions. Well, even though about 15-20% going to come from the poultry and 15-20% going to come from beef or pork, the majority of cases seem to come from eggs. Now, it doesn't matter how you get the raw egg or even the undercooked egg. It could be from eggnog or it could be from Caesar salad dressing or French toast or omelets or pancakes or egg batter foods, maybe like a Monte Cristo sandwich or a crab cake or from spaghetti, or ziti, or lasagna, or cream pie, or meringue. So lots of different ways to get it in from eggs that you don't necessarily think of as an egg product. Chickens are contaminated. Back in the late 19... I mean, I'm sorry, yeah, the late 1990s, we had a survey that the government said that there were probably about 20% of all chickens were contaminated with salmonella. More recently, the number has gone down to about 16%. And the government says, the USDA says, most recently, it's less than 7.5% of all chickens. However, Consumer Report looked at some of the broiler chickens available at the store and said, hey, 14% of these are contaminated contamination is somewhat less in the turkey industry. And you have to be careful because just freezing food isn't going to necessarily kill all of the organisms. And you have to be careful when you take some leftovers home. If you're going to reheat the food, reheat it to appropriate temperatures. And if you have some soup or you have some gravy, you ought to boil it. Because especially in foods with high fat, the organisms tend to be increasingly resistant. And be careful with your pets, whether you're talking about a pet dog or a cat or a chick or a guinea pig or a lizard or a frog or a turtle. All of these may have contamination. 
contamination so that when you pet them, when you touch them, or when you touch the water bowl, or you let the animal come on the counter, you may find that they spread the salmonella. And you have to be careful. When we're talking about the farm, the soil is infected, we have or contaminated, we have insects, we have birds flying overhead and leaving their droppings. We have contaminated waters, waters that carrier animals get into and they leave some of the bacteria and the bacteria can live for a long time without a host. And then you have to worry about the seafood from some of these contaminated waters. And then in the processing plants, it's possible that roaches or mold or dirt or bird droppings or leaky roofs may contaminate the food. And then on top of that, we have a lot of people who believe that all you need are those alcohol-based hand sanitizers, and that's adequate. No, it's not adequate, especially if you have soiled hands. What's adequate is washing with soap and water, and you ought to wash for at least 20 seconds. And then if you're leaving the restroom, you ought to turn the water off with the towel and use that same towel to open the door. You want protection, protection, protection. You need a couple cutting boards, one for the meat, one for the vegetables. You want to make sure you refrigerate the food, you freeze the food promptly when you bring it home. You want to be especially careful of foods that might be contaminated, the French toast and the frostings and the eggnog and the cookie dough and the mayonnaise, all different ways that you might get in contact with raw egg products. What are the defenses that we have? Well, the defenses include your stomach acid. That's going to kill somewhere around 94, 95, up to 99 percent of all of the organisms. That's why you need 100,000 organisms as the infecting dose, because you need a bunch of organisms, because a lot of them are going to get killed. But if you take an antacid, you take the Tagamet or you take the Tums or the Rolaids, it's going to decrease the acid. And then if you've used an antibiotic, you're going to kill some of the so-called good bacteria. And when you kill the good bacteria, you're going to leave more room for the bad bacteria to start to grow. Now, it's the organism itself. It's not the toxin that causes the infection. It gets into the intestine, then it goes through the mucus layer, gets into the intestinal cell itself, and releases an endotoxin, kills the cell, causes a massive immune reaction. And that immune reaction is going to lead to diarrhea, and the diarrhea is going to be inflammatory and secretory. You're going to malabsorb your food. And in the end, you might be kind of sick just because you didn't pay enough attention just because you let the leftovers sit in the car for a couple hours before you refrigerated them, you didn't cook or reheat the gravy adequately, you were a little imprudent around those eggs, so be careful. Now you know all about salmonella. It's out there and it's just waiting to ruin your day. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thank you.